16th of December, 1944. Checkmate, Hocker says to Brilla, and puts his queen in a position so that his two bishops cannot offer any defence. I did not count on your simple-minded shepherd move, Brilla growls angrily. The simplest way often leads to the goal more quickly than the most complicated subterfuges. Hocker laughs at him. What do you know about it? Brilla balls and shoves the primitive figures again into their starting positions. Give up, old boy, Hocker waves. Today you do not have any luck with the game. Perhaps you should try it with romance. You know even less about that, Brilla responds. You only mean that because you consider yourself irresistible. Hocker laughs cunningly. I have already seen how the women treat you like a stepmother. Brilla pushes him. The rotten whores only serve as a spittoon and do not count, Hocker hisses contemptuously. And you cannot get anywhere with the others, and with that your repertoire is exhausted. Brilla tries to silence him. That is right where you make your great mistake, old timer. Hocker contradicts him and lets the wood figures fall into a rusted can as his long eyelashes sink like curtains over his eyes. So, I would have liked to see one that would have fallen in love with you, Brilla sneers further. Unfortunately, that is no longer possible, Hocker whispers. So, so, Brilla becomes curious. Did she drown herself in the village pond out of love to you? Don't puff yourself up, you chimpanzee. She died as a sacrifice in the bombing, Hocker hisses at him. Excuse me, I couldn't have known that. You never spoke about it, Brilla says, ashamed as three angry pairs of his friend's eyes stare at both of them. When was that, Willie? I ask to bridge the painful pause. The beginning of summer 1943, he answers, lost in thought. I had met her about a year before in a hospital in East Prussia. Her name was Gerda, and she was from the Ruhr region. At the hospital, I had my first pass when I met her in the hall, and she also wanted to go into the city. I was using a cane because of a bullet in the upper thigh. She offered to help me to the streetcar. We found out that we had the same goal, to go to the movies. From that day on, she looked after me every day. After I could walk better, we took a Wednesday afternoon walk. The weather was beautiful, and we enjoyed ourselves like children. We discovered a patch of deep yellow flowers on the edge of a stream. While we were picking them, her dress got under my boot, and it left a terrible spot on the bright cloth. Together we tried to wash it in the stream. She slipped, and I finally had the opportunity to take her in my arms without any resistance from her. After she could breathe once again, she invited me to start on the way back with her. But I was in love with her, and I also noticed her confusion. After some hesitation, she sat next to me in the young grass, but I had to promise her that I would be good. We did not say much. We each knew how things stood with the other. So we looked into the flowing water and listened to the beating of our hearts. An hour later we went back. The next day I had to look all over the building for her, since it was already 4pm and she had not seen me. I learned from one of her friends that she had been reproached by one of her superiors because she had flirted with a patient. But I knew where I could find her, and a little later I met her at the deck chairs. Are you crying out of anger because of the charges that they made or because of love for me? I asked after I saw the tear traces on her face and the wet handkerchief in her hand. The charge would not matter to me if our feelings in the middle of war had some purpose. Believe me, I am nearly twenty years old and never have I felt so miserable and yet so happy as in the past days, she answered, breaking out in tears. I calmed her and said I would speak to her superior, and we would become engaged. Now I must be the happiest human being under the sun, Willie, but I am not. Not yet. Then I cannot become engaged without having first introduced you to my parents, was her answer. Who are your parents? I asked with a pounding heart. Respectable people, the rest is not important, she answered defiantly. I asked her to also tell me what, in her opinion, was the rest that did not matter, and I learned to my shock that she was the child of rich people. Immediately I made my plans to return to the front as quickly as possible. Does your leg hurt? she asked, concerned. No, it is doing well. I will report tomorrow to the doctor in charge, I explained. 
Aren't you satisfied with the treatment you are receiving? She wanted to know. Yes, very much, I said, and felt an unusual hate rising in me against the beautiful rich girl. Why is she not poor? Why am I not rich? Angrily, I sprang to my feet and went quickly into the house to escape her and my thoughts, but she held me back. What has happened to you? Is it a crime that my father has been luckier than yours? I do not know who you are or where you come from, but I do know that I love you, and whoever I love my father will not reject. It is only the war that stands between us. Two weeks later we left the hospital together. She had completed her year, and I had my recovery leave pass. The trip for most of the travellers in the overcrowded leave train may not have been very comfortable, but the closer we were pressed together, the happier we felt. In Hanover we said goodbye. She wanted to prepare her parents and I had to visit my father. At the end of June, after only seven days at home and after talking everything over with my father, I stood with her across from her parents. I immediately recognised that the grey-haired man, apart from his money, was still a butcher. Raw, but with a heartfelt greeting, he received me and continued to shake his head. My Gerda had to go to East Prussia, can you imagine East Prussia, to find the most dainty butcher boy. The boy must be hungry, the old lady said, and forced me to the table. The next morning Gerda showed me her father's business. It was not as large as I had imagined, but the man had really made something out of it. An hour later I had exchanged my uniform for the butcher's apron and began making a type of sausage from my home in Baden in this Rhineland shop. In the following days my happiness lacked for nothing. It was perfect, only one thing was too much and unnecessary as a goiter. The war. In September it grabbed me again and guided me a few weeks later into the hell of Stalingrad. Just as the Russians had enclosed us in the bitter cold kettle, I was hit in the shoulder by a grenade splinter. After a few anxious days, I lay on my belly in a Ju-52 plane. I could go home and I could see Gerda once again. In the meantime, her father had arranged for her to stay at home. He had become sick and she was indispensable for his work. As a consequence of my wound, I was also no longer fit for work, but I willingly stepped into the unfamiliar paperwork that is associated with such a shop. After the end of my furlough, I would have willingly taken Gerda to my father, especially because the enemy flyers could not find our little nest, and there was no worthwhile objective to bomb, unlike in the Rhineland, where they constantly disturbed the night sleep of the good citizens there. Love me as I love you and return again, she sobbed as the train rolled from the station. A telegram had instructed me to report to a replacement pool at Horb. Ten days later, the letter that I had written right after my arrival was returned unopened. I stood with shaking knees and spoke with the mayor's office in her city. Enemy planes have destroyed the shop. The owner, family members and employees are buried in the ruins. The news shot like a flame from the receiver, which I simply dropped and stumbled out of the booth. On the same evening I sat in a train headed north, but I came too late, much too late. The victims of the attack had been buried for days, and among them was my entire happiness, Gerda. Hocker's mouth closes hard and becomes silent in obvious pain. We sit petrified around the most sensitive, bravest and hardest companion among us, who had endured, suffered, bled and sacrificed more than all four of us together. The passion still had not found an end. Since this morning German divisions have been on a fast march westward. Spokesman Mola screams into the tent and observes with gleaming eyes the open mouths of the unbelieving comrades staring at him. Like a sinew that has been suddenly set free, Brilla jumps up, grabs Mola by the shoulders. Is it true? Is it really true? He gushes. Yes, says Mola. X day has arrived. The reaction of the men is indescribable. An almost heavenly light shines in the hollow-cheeked faces and an incomparable joyous roar sounds in the half-dark tent. That which we have hoped for so long has come. German divisions are in a fast march toward the west. As Allied forces reached the borders of Germany near Aachen, Hitler ordered a last great counter-offensive along the 85-mile-wide Ardennes sector in Belgium. 
known by the Americans as the Battle of the Bulge and by the Germans as the Ardennes Offensive, the surprise attack force of 250,000 men under Field Marshal von Rundstedt was launched on December 16, 1944, in the midst of fog, drizzle, snow and haze. Pushing through the narrow valley called the Losheim Gap, where German armies had passed en route to France in 1870, 1914 and 1940, the German offensive broke through an inadequate number of US troops, pushing 50 miles westward toward the English Channel with Antwerp as the ultimate goal. German soldiers dressed in American uniforms created havoc as they changed road signs, cut telephone wires and spread terrifying reports about the oncoming Germans. Thousands of American soldiers were taken prisoner and forced to march eastward toward Germany. The defence of the surrounded town of Bastogne under the acting commander of the 101st Airborne Division, Brigadier General Anthony McAuliffe, halted the offensive as the bad weather broke on December 22nd and the encircled soldiers were supplied by C-47s. The Allies went on the offensive on January 3, 1945, and a month after it began, the Battle of the Bulge was over. While the 1st and 3rd US armies lost 8,400 killed with 69,000 wounded and missing, the Ardennes offensive was a costly gamble for the Germans, who suffered around 10,000 casualties and lost 600 tanks and assault guns and over 1,600 planes. In his two-volume biography, Adolf Hitler, John Toland writes of the aftermath of the Battle of the Bulge. It reminded many of Napoleon's retreat from Moscow. Men shuffled painfully through the snow feet encased in burlap bags with shawls wound around their heads like careless turbans. They plodded on frozen feet, bedeviled by biting winds, bombs and shells. The wounded and sick crept back to the homeland with lotting insides, ulcers oozing, pus running from destroyed ears. They staggered cast on numb feet with despair in their hearts, stricken by dysentery, which left its bloody trail of filth in the snow. Their will was broken. Few who survived the retreat believed there was now any chance of German victory. Almost every man brought back a story of doom, of allied might, and of the terrifying weapon forged in the Ardennes, the American fighter. The G.I. who came out of the battle was the quintessential American, the man Hitler did not believe existed. A December 1944, an ice-cold wind sweeps from the sea through the canvas quarters. The captive occupants of the tent lie upon the cold earth wrapped in their coats and blankets, but their dreams are filled with hope as Schultz and I quietly step into the open and look at the grey, snow-filled sky. The machine guns stare from the watchtowers. The Americans have strengthened the guard. The German offensive must be the cause. Smiling, we make our way to the latrine for our appointment with Mola. Good morning to you. He extends his hand from his throne, and I immediately notice that he has not really been using the latrine, only waiting for us. But at this hour there is no one to overhear us. Not until after the coffee has been distributed is there a run on this place. Still, we sit to the right and left of Moyla and let our cigarettes hang from the corners of our mouths. To take all doubt from you, I brought the stars and stripes with me. Even if you cannot read English, it will not be hard for you to discern the German success. Möller opens the conversation and pulls the small American army newspaper from his field blouse. Shaking as though with fever, Schultz and I reach at the same time for the page. Luftwaffe Like 1940 are the headlines printed in large letters over the report from the front. The Americans admit that the offensive was a complete surprise and express in the report their amazement at the firepower of the German divisions as well as their bold attack, although the weather, from their viewpoint, is most adverse to such an undertaking. While the German air force is whirling in the sky, they maintain that their own aircraft must be kept on the ground because of the weather. Moller explains to us as we both attempt to decipher the report for ourselves we are successful in getting enough from the black and white lines that the last doubts fall from us. An offensive which is carried forward with such force will not fail to bring about a successful breakthrough, is Schultz's commentary. I was always of the viewpoint that the Americans must be grappled with during the winter. 
Unfortunately, they are better prepared with clothing than we were in 1941 before Moscow, I mumble, satisfied, as Mola takes the newspaper back and puts it away. I must dampen your healthy optimism just a little, Mola continues. Whether you believe it or not, I do not consider this offensive the deciding one. According to my calculations, it has been undertaken too early. It may be that it is something of a preparation to help create a more favourable situation, but the supply lines cannot be established in such a short time for a breakthrough. I don't understand that, Mola, I interrupt him. The offensive is occurring in the Ardennes, Field Marshal von Rundstedt is an experienced strategist, and I can imagine that he wants to drive a wedge between the English and the Americans, and then turn to the north and south in order to encircle the enemy, and at the same time push toward Paris with his tank companies. As far as strategy goes, you have thought it through carefully. Moyla laughs, slightly amazed. But unfortunately, you forget that we no longer live in the years 1940 to 1942, when we had enough materiel as well as men, weapons and equipment. In the meantime, the enemy bombs have significantly reduced our production. No, what does not please me is the absence of the new weapons. The reports do speak about a new kind of fighter plane, but there is nothing in the newspaper about what I have been waiting for. From my viewpoint, that does not tell me anything. Schultz reaches in. Just imagine what confusion this unexpected attack has caused our enemy. It is clear that the censors attempt to prevent everyone from losing their heads because of such alarming reports. These initial successes cannot be maintained only with carbines. I believe in the deployment of the new weapons. We will have to wait and see how these things work out, Mola indicates. And now, coming back to us, you have certainly noticed that they assigned four men to each guard tower, with two machine guns. That is clearly connected to the offensive. I am afraid that when our troops reach a certain point, the Americans will load all prisoners of war on the ships as fast as possible. It is up to us to hinder it. I know for certainty that down in the Cherbourg harbour there are a large number of tanks outfitted with everything necessary, awaiting transportation to the front. Our assignment is to determine who among the non-commissioned officers are tank drivers, gunners, etc. Compile a secret list, so that when the time is right, we can get them all together. By the way, pay attention to the mood in the cages. Try to suppress talk about an upcoming fight, and wait patiently until I know something definite, and then I will get back in touch with Vo. Listen, Moela, hold up the secretive camp spokesman. If you believe that you can expect something like that from me without knowing anything about you, then you will be greatly disappointed. I am certainly ready to do everything that will bring us freedom, but I am not going to leave myself open to an adventure that results in useless bloodshed. That is what I wanted to say, Schultz chimes in. We are not dumb boys that you can persuade to join in a dangerous game. I would not think of setting in motion a mutiny by unarmed prisoners of war which would end in certain death and still not have any influence on the war. You must not look at it that way, Moeller goes on the defence. It is clear that we are not planning a simple mutiny, but only in case of an emergency to hinder being shipped out, that is to help the approaching German troops to conquer the city and harbour of Cherbourg. Until it is that far, we must eat quite a few American biscuits, I explain, and then we will see what the hour demands of us. You are aware of the rumours that are coursing through the camp about marching the prisoners of war to Dunkirk or Lorient? Yes, I have heard about them. I know that some idiots are exchanging tobacco for knives and spears with the neighbouring enclosure. Unfortunately, it is non-commissioned officers, whose naivete will bring a heavy burden to the entire cage. But this matter does not have anything to do with that. I have revealed the goal of our plan to you. At present there are a thousand men in the cage, but including you too, only nineteen know about this plan. Or in the meantime, have you initiated your buddies? No, Schultz answers Mola's knife-sharp question. Then it is good, he calms himself and extends us his hand. Let's leave it up to our comrades to create the circumstances and keep quiet in the meantime. If I get further news about any success, I will get with you again, he says cool and leaves, headed in the direction of the kitchen barracks. 
There are several playing with fire in the most light-hearted manner, I whisper to Schultz on the way into the tent. I find Mola's conduct at the moment irresponsible, Schultz continues angrily. He does not believe with his whole heart in the success of the offensive and still is trying to instigate resistance. I am in favour of keeping out of these things until there is some real promise of success, and I am in favour that we watch out for ourselves until fate forces us to jump in and swim with the course of events, is my determined conclusion. Does that mean that you too do not believe any more in the final German victory? Schultz remains standing, looking at me, surprised. Allow me to at least be honest with myself and my friends. This offensive will not bring the German troops to Cherbourg. That was clear to me from the beginning. Möller is well informed about the German military potential. In his opinion, the offensive was begun too early. Why? Only because of doubt. But operations that are undertaken too early point to a war ministry that is nervous and carry the seed of failure within, because the necessary preparations are not all completed. It may be that the Americans will lose their heads. I know from Normandy how weak they are when they come under a hard attack, but if we do not have any mysterious weapons to put into action, which can lay waste to their divisions, they will stand up again and with their most courageous attackers smother us with their material. I think in the first place on the mighty Anglo-American airplane fleet, which can only be dragged out of the skies with a wonder weapon. Build them faster than the enemy can destroy them, is the motto of the American aircraft and shipbuilding industry. As prisoners we have already seen some of it, which does not lead one to doubt their power. Let's wait, Schultz. In a week we will know better. Just don't get your hopes too high, because they may never be fulfilled. I consider you to be the kind of a man that can endure the hard truth. That is why I let you know of my doubts. Silently, Schultz swallows the bitter pill and goes with me into the tent. By Christmas we will be home, is what they have said since the 1st of September 1939, to every soldier of this war every year again and again, and now they do not even believe it themselves. December 1944 And strengthen one another in the faith that next Christmas we will celebrate as free human beings in the homeland with our families. Spokesman Mola ends his short talk, as so many have done before him, and distributes, like a Santa Claus sent from heaven, the Christmas gifts, which the kitchen personnel have prepared for today, after saving for weeks. Yes, we really do celebrate Christmas. No organised Christmas with tinsel and electric lights on a Christmas tree, expensive presents and a stuffed belly. No, we celebrate Christmas as in the original manner, from our inner impulses born in the moment of need and highest affliction. As Mola leaves the tent to go into the other quarters to take the other comrades the gifts from the kitchen, we sit on the earth deep in thought, staring at the impenetrable darkness. No word, no sound disturbs the silent night in the overfilled tent. While the weary heads of the imprisoned soldiers rest on their knees and the homesick hearts quiver with cramps, we hold in our limp hands the Christmas cake baked by our comrades until the sugar coating becomes sticky because of the warmth of our hands. The nibbling begins only gradually. It tastes wonderful. We whisper to ourselves and pull ourselves and others back into reality. For a few minutes, gentle murmuring displaces the holy silence. Scraping sounds let recognise that the first are wrapping in their blankets and coats in mute dialogue with their relatives in far-off, death-threatened Germany to celebrate, the most lonesome Christmas of their lives. But suddenly there is a light in the tent. It is not the star of Bethlehem, but a can filled with wax painstakingly scraped from the provision boxes and an ordinary string as a wick. The flickering light brightens the windy quarters, Sixty pairs of eyes glimmer and stare for seconds at the light as a symbol of all life. Silent night, holy night, raw and with shame suppressed, but more celebrated than in the Cologne Cathedral, the song of Christianity pours from the throats of the men up to the flapping tent roof and finally brings Christmas among those who have been overtaken by the war. After the song has died out and all have wrapped themselves in their blankets, a mournful voice from the furthest corner of the tent begins the Christmas story. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. 
and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. And so it was that while they were there the days were accomplished that she should be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, for unto you is born this day the Saviour. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. It would be beautiful, Hocker whispers to me as the speaker ends, and an icy silence spreads throughout the tent. Even this day will come for mankind, Willie, I whisper back, and in firm belief pull the blanket over my head. December 1944, since eight o'clock, the American attendant O'Brien has been hammering on the kitchen barracks, and he is still not satisfied with the results of his efforts. Lazily I sit on an empty box and wonder with the cynicism of a slothful fellow at the drive to work of this American. Why does this free man carry on with such work while hundreds of hands are carried around by their owners deep in coat pockets? What kind of a Yankee is he that comes into the cagey and worries about the filth in the latrine and the cleanliness of the tents? No words of complaint, accusation or threat have come from his lips during these seventeen days. Besides, he is red-haired and does not give the impression that he would be led around by the nose. But he conducts the roll call conscientiously, cares for the provisions, and has been hammering board after board on the shaky kitchen barrack for two hours. He is certainly your best worker, I speak to Mola as he steps out of the kitchen. You are certainly right about that. He laughs heartily and glances toward the American. Is anything wrong? The attendant grins at us and shoves the hammer in his back right pocket. No, your work is okay, Mola calls to him. Unusual bird from the States, I indicate in passing to Mola, while I hope to get from him a message about the front. A decent fellow, this O'Brien, Mola continues with the topic. Very intelligent, deeply religious, unfortunately a little too thick-headed. He is Irish, born in Ireland, I ask. No, only descended from Irish. His parents had just emigrated before he was born, Mola answers. How does he feel about us? I finally become interested in the man. Not good and not bad. He is Catholic and believes that Hitler wants to dissolve the churches in Europe. They eat up everything that their propaganda ministers put before them. We too, I laugh out loud. That is really not so. Or do you believe that Germany will finally be destroyed if we lose the war? Mola asks. Many kingdoms and principalities have already passed away in the long history of the people, but the people continue to live on. Poland has been divided often, but still it exists today. Even Germany will continue to exist. You cannot wipe out a nation of 70 million people. I express my opinion. Ireland is Catholic and thoroughly hates England because they withhold freedom from them. One could believe that you have already spoken with O'Brien. Then he offers the same viewpoint about Ireland as you, Moella indicates. Recently he told me that his father has half a heart for Germany. According to his viewpoint, America is carrying on the war only to get out of its own economic misery. Then both father and son were unemployed in the USA until the outbreak of war. God knows how many times I have heard that. According to some, the war is only a business for the USA. I shake my head. Also for us, even war is fought over money, that is, over power, which means the same thing. Mola laughs. Yes, yes, I know that too, but we always forget it, I snarl in remembrance of my own reflections. You can thank the propaganda for that, my dear. With it and the dumb ones is how war is conducted. Mola slaps me on the shoulder with a ringing laugh. But now I must see about the food. By the way, Aachen has been in German hands once again since Christmas. The fight continues in the Ardennes, but the Germans are slowly running out of steam. Didn't I say that the supplies would not be enough? He turns abruptly toward the kitchen and leaves me alone in grief. Sitting between my friends, I shovel the food slowly and thoughtfully into my mouth. 
The disagreement which has arisen since my open comments about the outcome of the war can no longer be kept a secret. Distrust has also arisen in our ranks. Only Hocker greets me as openly as always, while Schultz, along with Siegfried and Briller, apparently are practising restraint. Still in doubt who I should take in hand without letting the present discord become known throughout the entire tent, an opportunity arises by itself when Schultz asks for my help in washing the dishes. Without hesitation, I follow him to the water faucet, where we sullenly carry out the work in the midst of a crowd. As usual, we go to the fence afterward and hang the cans upside down on the wire so that the water can drip out while we wipe our cold, wet hands dry on our pants. We will get some snow, Schultz says incidentally, and rolls his head in the direction of the sky. And we must part, Schultz, if we cannot understand one another any more. I step close to him and force his gaze into my eyes. It does not have to go that far, at least that is not what I'll wish, he explains very seriously. Who wishes it then, I want to know. No one, he answers defiantly. Schultz, we are no longer children. If I am no longer agreeable to you, then I will face the consequences. I bluster to my confidant of earlier days. That can never be the subject, but you have upset everyone with your change in outlook. I never would have expected it from you, that you would turn your back to our just cause, he stammers, unrestrained. You are distorting the facts. Am I somehow disloyal if I clearly believe what will become of the offensive, I ask, becoming calmer. You no longer believe in victory, and that is why you disappoint us, he shows his colours. After our conversation with Mola, I indicated that the offensive would do as much good as hitting the water if no wonder weapons are deployed. With regard to Hocker, after long consideration, I went further and explained to him that militarily the war is lost. My hope lies entirely with the intention of the Western powers or the course of a merciful fate. During the Seven Years' War, the Russian Tsarist died shortly before midnight and saved Frederick the Great from certain defeat. Perhaps Stalin will die tomorrow, and through his death make all of the troops on the Eastern Front free for the Western Front. Only one of these possibilities, or both together, offer us salvation from the chaos. And if you do not see that, then I will tell you what I have just learned from Moela. The offensive is running out of gas, coming to an inner peace with myself. I observe the harsh face of my friend after I have told him the bitter truth and expressed my unlikely hopes. Becoming contemplative, he nervously chews his spanking clean fingernails and stares at the rusty barbed wire. What you say cannot be simply dismissed, the stubborn Niedersachsen concedes. That success is only possible with the new weapons is something I have been clear about for a long time, but it is not the only hope that keeps us going. And that is just what you are about to do, take everything from us. Let the thing run its course. In the end, it doesn't matter what we are fighting about and making life difficult. You told me once in Alencon that it would be the intelligent ones that the barbed wire would finish off. Is that why you have joined with the fools? Are you now carrying on ostrich politics? It's all right, Schultz. Lay your hands in your lap and imagine that you will be a millionaire at the end of your days. That way you can more easily survive the rough years. Then it will not be so bad when at seventy you realise that you have deceived yourself. But don't expect that the world around you will participate in the swindle. Otherwise you are not responsible since we are younger. We must star tail over and we cannot begin soon enough. I tear the mask of camouflage from our faces. What do you plan to do now based on your viewpoint? He asks luringly. Nothing? What can I do as a prisoner? We must wait through all the long months and convince ourselves that life will always go on. If the war comes to an end in the next few weeks then we must make the best out of what the victors give us. But I fear that we personally will not see the homeland very soon, since after the last war two years passed before they sent the prisoners home, I answer without pathos. And what is with the idea of national socialism, he asks, forms of government come and go. Perhaps they will allow the good achievements of this epoch to be carried into the new world, I ponder. All right then let's allow the events to run their course. What you have said often presses down on me during the long nights. 
But one does not willingly believe in what he doesn't want to have happen. You have aired your thoughts, and I see that you feel better. We will stick together to the bitter end. He extends to me his hand, and that is right, Schultz, because then we will need each other more than ever. I join in and at the same time congratulate him on his birthday. He looks at me in surprise and is obviously deeply affected as he mumbles, You did not forget it. 1st January, 1945. Happy New Year, Happy New Year. We shake each other's hands and wish one another a happy return home. With old familiarity, we listen to the crunching of snow under the boot soles. With the collars of our coats turned up and our hands buried as deep as possible in the pockets, I wander alone around the cage. It is about nine o'clock of the first day of the new year. I breathe deeply the aromatic air into my lungs and listen to myself. A year has fulfilled its destiny. It began full of hope on the snow-covered training grounds of Munsingen and led me in the first days into France. I was happy that I did not land on the Eastern Front, but we underwent hard training in the beginning in order to be ready for the eventual enemy invasion. After being stationed in Bayeux, Caen and Saint-Malo, we were transferred to the Cotentin Peninsula under a hail of grenades from the many Americans who had landed. In addition to much misery and shortages was added the destruction of my brand new apartment in the homeland as well as the interruption of all contact with home. The month of August saw me leave the hospital healthy, but in Paris I learned about the destruction of my division. Late summer brought imprisonment. Unnameable sorrow, both physical and spiritual, has been my companion since then. And the war still goes on. The sons of Germany condemned to death are now fighting their last doubtful struggle against all powerful forces in the icy cold. Afterward, a graveyard silence will lie over blood-soaked Europe, and only the cries of widows and orphans will be heard until the screams of the victors rise up and the blood and tears trickle away in shame. Check, I call to Schultz, very pleased with myself because I have driven him into a corner. That was a well-thought-out move, Helmut. You have learned a lot in the last while. Siegfried presses himself as a kibitzer in the game. You should not mix in, Siegfried. I don't like it. Schultz sets him straight and brings his king into presumed security. Checkmate, Schultz. I tie him up completely as I bring into position the rook that he has overlooked. It is a game for a king. However, it demands all one's attention. I excuse Schultz and make room for Brilla. Let's play a game, Helmut, the farm boy indicates, reaching for the figures. I am too tired, Robert, and it is just about dark, I excuse myself. Why don't you play with me any more? he asks, offended. Because you are a poor loser, I answer him honestly. Come on, let's at least go for a walk before dinner. The time passes faster. He does not let himself be repulsed, and I step outside with him. During the last days you have been evading me, Helmut. May I know the reason why? He immediately opens fire after we step onto the walk. I do not avoid anyone, but you have spoken behind my back so that I could not defend myself. I reveal my disappointment. I will not deny it, but do not believe that anyone has cursed you. You have changed your viewpoint, but that is your business. I mean, the two of us and Hocker have known each other the longest, and there must not be any contention between us, he speaks in an atoning voice. I am not interested in any strife, but I will not lie to myself and others any longer, and whoever cannot bear the truth can continue to stick his head in the sand. I verbalise my wounded pride. Do you really think we will lose the war? he asks freely. I really do not like talking with you about it because you lose your head so easily, old fellow. I smile roguishly into his jovial eyes. That is behind me. It does not matter any more. I did my duty and wanted the best. If we go swimming, I too will get wet. There is no escape, he comments, fully composed. Will you go back to Austria after we return home? Austria will once again be independent. I take part in his fate. I will slip into any hole that gives off warmth when all this is over. As poor as I will be after this war, I can no longer afford to be a luxurious character. If my wife will no longer have me, I will lie somewhere else in a ready-made bed. 
In my profession there will be a shortage of workers since no painting has been done for years. Today we begin a new year. I hope that we will soon begin a new life. He spreads before me in his usual trust his plan for the future. Don't you think about the French woman with the paint store? I joke with him. That was a fantasy. You don't build a marriage on such a flimsy relationship. I tell you that everything that is in the past no longer matters to me. He stops in front of our tent as the food carriers enter. I must admit that in your personal situation you have done much more planning than me, I acknowledge freely. In the camp at Chartres, I ridiculed your feelings. I am doing it again today. Use your common sense and think now about your home, instead of troubling yourself about strategy and talk about the end of the world. Don't be a hothead and give other people right if they talk about dumb things. That way you have your peace from them, and you still stand in high regard with them. He gives me a well-intentioned lecture. One thing more, Helmut. He holds me firm as I start to go. Is everything between us now like it used to be? Just like before Robert comes impulsively from my lips. Then let's get at the dried corned beef so that we will have strength to endure. He laughs in his old way and scurries ahead of me into the dark tent where we are received in our re-established trust by Schultz, Hocker and Siegfried. January 1945 the icy cold penetrates mercilessly through our worn-out uniforms. Even more mercilessly do the Americans conduct a raid and bring into the daylight, with mine-searching instruments, those items which the prisoners of war had produced during the many days and nights, or acquired by trading in order to one day regain their freedom. Before our eyes lie, in a pile, many knives, picks, shovels, and iron bars which make for a wild tangle, we recognise the mental condition of the would-be escapees. Now foreign hands search our pockets in a familiar manner, but that is not enough. Undress and lay all of your clothes in front of you. The command sounds from an American which causes our hair to stand on end. But it does not help. We must follow the order and we do so in blunt bitterness. Wrapped in thick fur coats and overshoes, the searchers go slowly through the open rows and direct their instruments over the half-rotten clothing of their imprisoned opponents. And they have success, nothing less than parts of two pistols with the necessary ammunition come to light. Not only are the Americans amazed, but we too stare in unbelieving wonder at the blue, dull, gleaming weapon parts. A light pride enters my heart and warms the blood for a moment. Faster than the much-feared costume ball in the German army barracks, we jump into our clothes again. With stiff fingers, we rub our numb limbs and tarry, awaiting further measures, but the Americans have time. After half an hour of useless standing around, they withdraw their soldiers and with them one-third of the inmates. Spokesman Müller can no longer be seen. Wrap in the blankets, lie in a horizontal position and keep your mouth shut is the only thing that we can do at the moment, Schultz suggests to our excited tent, which returns intact but is carrying on a wild spectacle. Such idiots in their childish simple-mindedness dig a grave for themselves and others. The mob raves until the last one has found his place and fatigue and weakness bring sleep to the tormented ones. We receive no food at noon, but at 3 p.m., a gloomy-looking sergeant appears with his men to conduct roll-call and introduce the new camp spokesman, who looks just as gloomy dressed in the uniform of a Navy artillery sergeant. The kitchen personnel must be reinforced because more than half of them were caught in the search. To the great surprise of all Germans, the American asks naively who among us knew how it was possible for Mola to disappear without being noticed. Of course, no one admits to any knowledge of the entire affair. As the Americans leave the assembled crowd to the new German spokesman and depart, an intense discussion rises within the ranks about the underground movement, which only a few suspected. The rumours that surfaced now and again about a march on the fortress at Dunkirk were considered by most as the pure fantasies of certain big mouths. Everyone is quietly happy that they did not have anything to do with the matter, or at least were not discovered during the shakedown. But still it is apparent from the more or less open conversations of individual groups that the remaining 800 men still plan to be freed by German troops. 
January 1945. After the scanty breakfast is behind us, we five friends step out into the cold winter morning with our blankets under our arms and walk across the hard, frozen assembly area, ground into the school tent. Since some of the occupants of our cage have been transported away, there are some tents that are empty, and so the new spokesman is using the opportunity in conjunction with the available teaching staff to establish a school, which finds general approval among our comrades. And today we are attending the first instruction. English, as it is spoken, that is what I will teach you. The teacher, a sergeant we have known since Alencon says, and begins with an ambitious method. That's my hair. He takes hold of his hair and has everyone repeat after him. And these are my eyes. He points to his eyes and continues further until all parts of the body have been identified and his teachable pupils can repeat them. In the second half hour, he goes on to clothing and works patiently until the last person in the tent can say the English words, pants button. At the end of the hour, the man has accomplished a great deal through his practical teaching method and finds grateful recognition from all the students. The next class is philosophy, and most of the men leave. It is too high for me. Brilla laughs and hurries past us outside. I am just ready to join my friends when a sergeant speaks to me. Slay here, comrade. It doesn't cost anything, and what I can pass on to you about life is of unmeasurable use, I don't know. I attempt to break away, whether I have the understanding for philosophy. To be honest with you, I don't know much about it. Probably there are few here who know what philosophy is all about, but they are staying here to learn about it, he smiles shrewdly. Good, I don't want to miss out on anything. I declare myself reedy. You will not regret it. If you stick with it, he shoves me back into the half-dark tent and stands on a wooden box. I see that some comrades feel sorry for me because only a few listeners have remained, he begins. But that lies in the nature of the matter, since philosophy is a subject for everyone and no one. Even though nearly everyone is more or less his own philosopher, only a few know what it is and seeks. That is why, as an introduction, I will begin with the nature of philosophical thought, specifically that of Thales of Miletus, who lived in Asia Minor about 600 years before Christ. With stirring emotional words and summarising sentences which are precisely formulated, he unveils the nature of thought and leads his listeners into a realm that hardly any one of us has ever entered before. Hanging on to every word that comes from the mouth of our teacher-philosopher, we sit on the rough-cut benches and experience a renewal of the spirit. Man recognises the world as chaos. Philosophy comes when man rises in struggle against chaos. After the philosopher has left the podium, we all remain listening in the following quiet. As though awakened from a trance, we slowly recognise our surroundings once again and thank our teacher with subdued applause. Was it boring? The philosopher asks me as I light a cigarette in front of the tent. Not one second, I acknowledge honestly, and now observe the man somewhat more closely. Since during his presentation I did not have any time to do so. He is a small, square-built man, about fifty years old, dressed in a worn-out navy coat and hat. His heavy eyebrows are grown together above his nose and stand like the wings of a bird above his black, shining eyes. The nose, slightly bent toward the mouth, reminds me of a horse. The mouth is broad, with the corners hanging almost to the middle of his angular chin, an ascetic. Come again, he says in my observation. I will pass on to you the wisdom of the greatest souls of this earth, and you will never find barbed wire the same. The stuff is so powerful that it threatens to crush me. I am now more confused than informed. I explain my inner thoughts. That is good. You are already in search and will find it. The only thing that you lack is the will to think, I mean conscious thought and no thought games. But if you want, I will gladly help you in your search for enlightenment. Not in grey theory, but from the pure light of history. Naturally, it will be apart from my series of lectures, in little talks which will provide a slow but thorough introduction, he suggests to me. Why are you going to all this trouble for me? I ask in amazement. I gain from it myself, in that I keep in practice and keep free through what is said. 
You have been in search of understanding for a long time and are awakened to conscious thinking. That is where philosophy takes its beginning. Use the time. It will never be available to you in such a rich measure. He counsels me, and then departs quickly. Philosophy! What a field, and something so completely new to me! Or have I not been in search of understanding for a long time world explanations and connections? The wind blows cold around my warm head. Alone I make round after round. Suddenly I come to realise that we are no strange goods of the war, but simply laid on ice. Laid on ice to learn and to recognise, so that one day we have the ability to build a new, better world, and to continue into the furthest generations. I will use the time, even though it seems to stand still for me. January 1945 Days come and go. No authentic news from the front or the homeland penetrates the rusted barbed wire. There is no answer to all of the letters and cards that we have written. Daily prison life holds us unmercifully in its claws and only allows the hours and days to creep along slowly. Tormented by eternal hunger, strangled by the senseless, dirty existence, the comrades fall to their own burdens. Quarrels about nothing rule the long days the dull doubt of the individuals, the even longer nights. Our life is an endless wait and death grins from the watchtowers. Now I must talk with you finally, a voice sounds in my ear. For the entire time I have tried to read in your face what is really happening inside you, but I have not been able to. On the outside you seem to be so calm and in control, but still I feel that for the first time you are really unhappy. What is going on inside you, Helmut? I will confide in you as far as I know myself. I answer him, a true, long-suffering friend. I have come to a turning point from my life up to this time. You know yourself that we have never thought so much about it as we have in the last months. As soldiers we muddled through our deceived life and took even thing for granted that was offered us by way of joy and sorrow. We lived not much differently than animals. Or have you given much serious thought about the suffering we brought with our march through the cities and villages of foreign lands? Not that we personally did anything to the people. In that case I cannot reproach myself for anything. But the many innumerable individual acts by people which the war in its totality has brought the most terrible suffering is what comes to my consciousness as we now sit in our own misery. Today no one can convince me that wars cannot be avoided. Clausewitz defined this horrible word warns the continuation of politics with other means. He was the teacher of modern strategy, and he must know for sure. But if war is the continuation of politics, that only tells me that incompetent politicians have prepared the way for war. Soon foreign soldiers will be marching through Germany. What kind of misery will they carry into the bombed-out cities? I have come to the recognition that war is nothing more than a crime. It is true that we always went into battle with a hurrah, but we were young, much too young to comprehend what kind of a wicked game we had been forced into. I don't mean just we Germans. No, all soldiers in this war are no different than misused creatures. What I cannot come to grips with, however, is the fact that our own fathers allowed it, even though they had this most bitter game behind them. One could say it was because of the propaganda which everyone succumbed to, but I do not understand how grown men could allow themselves to be lied to again. Yes, it is true that I am terribly unhappy with my new knowledge. Up to now I have believed, or at least imagined, that in a short time the war would end victoriously for us and we would soon be home. Now I know that the actual suffering is not behind us, but ahead of us, and that after years of frontline duty... I can only tell you that those who lie inside the tents and think about nothing more than from breakfast to lunch are to be envied. I believe you worry too much, Helmut. You envy the others and you brood day and night over unlaid eggs. Why do you run like you are possessed into every lecture if you are convinced that we will be enclosed by barbed wire for a long time? He asks, puzzled. Because despite everything, I still hope that the sun will shine for us once again not for those who can shoot faster and better than another, but for those who know more and can do more. In a school tent in Le Mans, a teacher said that knowledge is power, 
and ignorance is weakness, do you remember? This saying and its direction for a later civil life of creating and not destroying is what has guided my thoughts. Since that time, I am no longer satisfied in believing what I hear, but I attempt, through logic, to see what the consequences will be. I soon realised that in order to do so, one must be free of the piles of nonsense from the propaganda mills, as well as self-deception. That is why, after a long inner struggle, I have thrown over all of the ballast. Perhaps it was a mistake to throw the whole thing at your feet, but I must do it in order to be free. Then the lies are an inner prison, and bondage is the potential grave digger for every true friendship. I know too about the inner struggles of Schultz and Siegfried. Both are much too intelligent not to know what is coming. Unfortunately, they are too captivated by the fear they will lose face. Above all, because they have never made a distinction between the Führer and the people. They harden in this epoch, without looking to eternity and seeing what is best for the existence of our people. Our generation is responsible for the continuation of our people. If you say I will deal with the situation myself, it is correct. Only so far as you believe that while we are behind barbed wire time will stand still, that is only apparently so. In reality, fate has given us time for awareness and for personal renewal. From that comes the responsibility to use the time to keep our bodies, souls and spirits healthy. Since later, we will be the carriers of a new nation regardless of what consequences of war are laid upon us. I explain to Hocker everything that I have been wrestling with for weeks. After lunch and a refreshing nap, we friends undergo a thorough bath, which is made possible by the soap and washcloths that were distributed earlier in the morning. We complete the bitter but necessary process in a turbulent whirl because of the cold weather. Exactly at 3pm, we sit as usual in the school tent as an unexpected shrill whistle from the camp spokesman disturbs the beginning of class. All sergeants are to report immediately with their blankets and personal possessions, is the call that brings us to our feet and presses us out into the open. Is it another search? we ask, noticing the guard detachment entering the camp. Hurry up! the nervous spokesman encourages those who are lagging behind, while the first ones are already in place with their possessions. Left face, forward march, a red-haired overzealous master sergeant orders, after roll call and the tents have been inspected, as he leads us out of the cage. Silently the group moves through the narrow, barbed-wire-surrounded alleys. Without a sound, the warm breath of the men meets the cold air and builds a beard of fog in front of their faces. From the left and right, eyes as bashful as those of deer glance from behind the barbed wire and follow our way out of the camp with sympathy. Where are they taking us now? But there is no use in asking this question. With difficulty, the stiff legs carry the dulled heads over the abused high plain of Cap de la Hague. Suddenly, double rows of German prisoners under strong guard meet us coming from the opposite direction. In amazement, we look at the fur-lined winter clothing and the fresh but mask-like faces of the prisoners. Where did they catch you? Some of those in our ranks ask as they pass by, although the Americans are taking strict measures to prevent contact between the two groups. The Ardennes they whisper cautiously, and one can notice how strong they stand under the influence of their imprisonment. Look there, I say to Schultz, who walks beside me. Those are the survivors of the offensive, and they do not know that fate has meant well for them. He surprises me greatly. Do you understand where things stand and what assignment fate has decreed for the survivors? I ask almost happily. Yes, he answers with a hard face at the end of a lost war. I do not see anything more at least now. The rest is up to the victors what we can do afterward. One day they must let us go home. Then the families must be brought in order. Afterward the house, the city and the nation. And new life blossoms out of the ruins. I nudge him from the door of the present into the future. As night breaks, we friends lie with fifty-five other men, warm and reconciled on the hard floor of tent number 49 in the main Camp Cherbourg. Apparently, nothing has changed. Only the fences are somewhat further apart, but they also enclose nearly 3,000 men. Still the same salty wind blows over Cap de la Hague.